You know, I read an interesting blog post the other day titled, There is no shallow end of the theological pool. We'll quote from that post here in a few minutes because I like the way the author put something in particular. But it got me thinking about seeking God in the deep end and what that really means. We've had kind of a long-running series going on here, and I touch on it every month or so, on intimacy with God, how to be closer to God. And I think all the things that we've talked about up until this point might leave some people still feeling like that's all great in theory. That, that all sounds really easy uh, at, on surface level. And I'm still struggling. I'm still having a hard time with this idea. You know, let's think about some things here, some verses for you to consider. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Seek and you will find. In Acts chapter 17, verse 27, it says that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Romans chapter 10, verse 21, quoting from Isaiah 65, says, But as for Israel, he says, All the day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. It's interesting then that all these verses seem to have this idea that God is so open, so inviting, so welcoming, that He's the one extending Himself, that He's the one encouraging us to come to Him. So why does it still seem like it's so hard for us to draw close to Him? After all, it's easy for us to look at James 4 verse 8 that says, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you and assume, well, well, that sounds simple, doesn't it? That, that should be an easy process. How come it still isn't working for me? How come it doesn't seem so easy in practice? Why are my thoughts still occupied with doubt and fear and anxiety about my sins and my condition and my relationship with Him and even some fundamental questions like what's my place in the universe? What's the meaning of life? Is the Bible reliable and dependable and historically accurate? Why do I still have all of these questions running through my mind? And why is it that even though I'm searching, I'm not finding the satisfactory answers that I have been looking for? And perhaps the reason is that you're trying to find a God who fits nicely and neatly into a well-defined box. We're analytical people, aren't we? Everything has to have an answer. Everything has to have a solution. You ever get one of those puzzles? You know, you find them at like Cracker Barrel or something for 10 bucks. You find one of those little wooden puzzles. And they're supposed to like, if you pull the ring off this way and pull the cord this way, and like, voila, it all comes apart. But you sit there for like six hours, which turns into like six years, and you still can't figure it out. I had this little one when I was, uh, when I was younger. I had a jar, and it had a little, a little nut in it there. And you had to figure out some way of getting the nut between that and the cork. And it was like the most simple, ridiculous solution, which I won't tell you what it is. If you ever come over to my house and you want to play with it, I'm not going to tell you how to fix it or how to do it. But we want an, uh, we want an answer. We want a solution to God. And we want it to be neatly defined and organized. Our analytical minds are always trying to look for the solution the definite boundary. We want to know how long something takes to make, how long it needs to bake in the oven, how many ounces of this, how many pounds of that, how much is it going to cost, how long will it take to build that building, that structure. We want to know where things came from. Answers. I like in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11. Then in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, the writer of Ecclesiastes makes it clear that boundlessness bothers us. It confounds and frustrates us. It says, God has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. And what that verse is saying is, yes, we have a sense of, of eternal things, a sense of divine things, that it has been set in our hearts and yet not in such a way that we're ever really going to know the answer. And that bothers us. It frustrates us. I'm going to list off a number of scriptures here for you to think about on the unfathomableness of God. In Romans 11 and verse 33, it says that His judgments are unsearchable, that His ways are inscrutable. 
In Romans 11, verse 34, no one has known his mind and no one has been his counselor. In Psalm 145, verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable, as Isaiah 40 and verse 28 also says. He inhabits eternity, according to Isaiah 57, verse 15. From everlasting to everlasting, He's God in Psalm 90, verse 2. The depths of God are searched by the Spirit, and the Spirit comprehends the thoughts of God only. We are man, and He is God, and we will not understand His mind, according to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. No one has seen God, the only begotten God, who is at Father's side. No one has known Him. John 1 and verse 18. And the love of Christ, according to Ephesians 3, verse 19, surpasses knowledge. So according to one writer, until and unless the weight of God's infinite being is straining your thoughts to the breaking point, until and unless you have felt the finitude of your mental powers in contemplating the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you have not even begun to fathom the unfathomable depths of the one living, true, and triune God. God is a being that is so much bigger than we are, so much deeper and so much higher, so much wider than we can even comprehend. And until we're willing to acknowledge all of the things that we just said, until we're willing to acknowledge that He is so much bigger than we are, then we never really will understand Him. We really never will get what it means to understand God. And that's where the analogy comes into the deep end of the pool. When you're a kid like Sterling, you like the shallow end of the pool. You like where your feet can touch. And maybe if you're really brave, you'll go to where your toes touch. And you'll go to your chin. But as long as your toes touch, you feel safe. Because you're in control. Because you know where the bottom is. You, you, you know the definition of what's going on. I know the surface of the water. I know the bottom of the pool. We don't go into the deep end when we're young because we're scared of it. Your feet don't touch. There's the element of the unknown, the uncertainty, where if I jump in and I can't tread water, I won't have anything to put my feet on in the deep end. And that's all fine if you're four years old. But unless you want to be an adult wearing water wings the rest of your life, eventually you have to move on to the deep end of the pool. The deep end of the pool requires a leap of faith as well as maturity that matches the challenge. You will never understand what it means to enjoy swimming. You'll never understand what it means to enjoy God until you accept that there is a deep end of the pool that you are not in control of. Unless you're willing to embrace the nature of the deep end, you'll never enjoy it. You'll never go out there. You'll never see the benefits of it. But when someone embraces the nature of it, when someone embraces it, yes, my feet don't touch. And that's part of the appeal. Yes, the water's deep and dark and blue beneath my feet, but that's part of the joy of it. Nobody dives into the shallow end of the pool. Everybody knows that. The big, big signs there suppose says, no diving. Dude, this is two feet deep. No diving. No adult goes in and dives into the shallow end. Nobody enjoys swimming around in the shallow end. You never watch the Olympians in the Summer Olympics swimming around in a two foot deep kiddie pool because they understand that the only way you'll ever truly appreciate the freedom of swimming is if you're swimming in the deep end of the pool. Now, God is the same way. God is the same way. We prefer a God who's shallow, measurable, definable. A God where I know my feet can touch all the time. A God who I can keep in a box and control and understand and put it in definable human terms. That's a God I'm comfortable with when I'm at the maturity level of the four-year-old. It's a God who doesn't frighten us. 
And it's a God who doesn't require a leap of faith from us because our feet can touch. That's the easy, easy, definable God. But when we tailor make a shallow God for ourselves, it becomes easier to avoid troubling questions about who He is and what we're supposed to do in response to Him. But our God does not live in the shallow end of the pool. As the above verses all aptly point out, God is unfathomable. God is infinite, everlasting to everlasting. He is the deep end. He's not definable by human standards. We can't put him into a box. We can't contain him. And we can't define him from our limited perspective here on earth. And I think we need to acknowledge that some aspects of his character are inexplicable. I don't understand everything that he does. I don't understand some of the things that I read in the Bible. And I don't think a lot of people understand some things that we read in the Bible. The interesting thing about God is, God never feels compelled to apologize for that. You notice that? Nowhere in the Bible does God feel compelled to apologize for His unfathomable nature. He doesn't feel guilty about being unfathomable and eternal and everlasting. And while it might not be convenient to believe in a shallow God, it's less satisfying and substantial to believe in a shallow God. We miss the real nature of God and the joys of a relationship with Him when we avoid the deep end of the theological pool. So, how is it that I overcome my fears and seek God where He is in the deep end rather than where I am at first comfortable in the shallow end? And that's what this lesson is about, is how do we overcome fear? The first suggestion for you is this. Squeeze yourself through the narrow door. In Luke chapter 13, verse 24, we all know the phrase very well. It says, strive to enter through the narrow door. Jesus says, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. I like that it says, strive to enter by the narrow door. Strive to enter by the narrow door. There's effort that's required there. There's exertion that's required there. You're not very lazily going to enter the narrow door. You're not going to just slip in through the narrow door. You're not going to get some olive oil on your back and your belly and manage to squeeze your way in without some effort on your part. Strive, he says. Strive to enter by the narrow door. Work your way into it. Now understand, I'm not saying that you earn your salvation by your works because that's, I think, what immediately some might say is, wait a minute, hold on. I don't know about that, Ryan. I don't know about that. And it even Jesus himself says, strive to enter. Strive. Put effort into it. You're not the one who opens the door. Salvation is not by your power. You don't open the door. But you've got to get yourself to that position. And you've got to strive to get yourself to where God can take care of you spiritually. Don't give up then. I think this is one way to, to, to get into the deep end of the pool is don't give up and don't compromise when it comes to questions about God. Like all things that are worth the work, a relationship with God is never accomplished by accident. We also need to avoid the trap of thinking that once we have quote-unquote found God, that we no longer need to put any more effort into it. Sometimes people feel like they reach sort of a, a plateau spiritual and they go, okay, well, I'm satisfied now. I've answered the most basic questions about God. I know so the gist of the Bible, and I'm coming to church once a week. Okay, I'm set. I'm good. Time to get into a nice religious routine and just coast my way into heaven. That doesn't sound like striving to enter by the narrow door, does it? Nobody coasts their way into salvation. Nobody coasts their way into knowing God better. Nobody coasts their way into having good, strong Bible knowledge. Nobody coasts their way into easy evangelism. You don't coast your way into it. I like in James 1 verse 27, This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The phrase there, to keep oneself, reminds us that we could lose our salvation if we do not 
keep ourselves. Keep oneself unstained. Keep an eye out for it. Put effort into it. Never be satisfied then with the answers that you were satisfied with 15 years ago. And I, you know, when you were 15, 12, 13, 15, 16, whatever it is, when you became a Christian as a young person, if you were a teenager when you were baptized, when you became a Christian as a young person, you were probably pretty satisfied with most of the answers that you had. You were pretty satisfied with a surface level understanding of Revelation. You were probably pretty satisfied not understanding Ezekiel at all. When you were 15, you were satisfied with a certain set of answers. But when you become 25 and 35 and 45, don't just sit and be satisfied with what you knew or understood as a 15-year-old. Don't just sit and be satisfied with where you were when you first started the journey of being a Christian. Always try to do something more to grow, to become better. Never be satisfied with just getting by as a Christian. My second suggestion is this. Add a dose of humility. And if you're already a humble person, add a second dose of it. Pride is an incredible hindrance to those who are seeking God. And it's one of the reasons that Christ loves children so much. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, for example. Notice in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, the sentiment that is offered there by the Apostle. He says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Of course, that's what we're talking about there, is don't be children in your spiritual maturity. Don't stay a 15-year-old Christian for the rest of your life. And yet, he says, yet in evil be babies. In your thinking be mature. I love that you can have both at the same time. Isn't that cool? Isn't it cool that you can have both at the same time? You can be innocent like a baby, but mature in your approach to life. And, and they're not mutually exclusive conditions. We're to be that, though, in our thinking. God loves children because children are so humble. The other day, we were driving in the car and there was a thunderstorm on the horizon. And Sterling asked me, Daddy... Does God make rain? You know, and adults tend to be kind of cynical. Adults are, adults are like, well, you know, actually, it's a series of meteorological functions and conditions that result in... The, and I stopped myself like, you know what, Sterling? Yeah, God does make rain. And Sterling didn't need any more convincing than that. He didn't need any more thinking beyond that. Adults, though, adults are, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't like those stand pat answers. I don't. God loves children because children say things like, God makes rain. God is annoyed with adults because adults always question that fact. Well, who created the world? Did he create it in six days? D does God make provision for all of life on this planet? Does God help us with each and every day? Does God make the sun come up? Did God make that butterfly fly past my face? Does God make the flowers? Does God make the honeybees? You know what? Yes, He does. Yes, He does. Children are innocent. They're open. They're receptive. And they're never self-important or critical. Realize that you don't know as much as you think and accept the criticism and advice with meekness. I like in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. I think this is one of the reasons why people fail to find God. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 16 it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. And what does he say? What will you find there? You will find rest for your souls. Not, not you might, not you could, or you might hope to find rest in that place. No, he says, if you look for the ancient paths and you walk on the path that I tell you to, you will find rest and peace. But they said, we will not walk in it. We will not walk in it. So I set watchmen over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. 
their arrogance prevented them from ever finding God. Because they were not willing to relent and walk the path that God told them to, they never actually found Him. It's pride that leads us to resent the honest, genuine plea for repentance. Without humility being our guiding light, we just as easily become bothered and offended when the truth is peacefully, respectfully presented to us. Some application then on this point is this. Seeking God humbly means a few things. Here's a few things to think about as far as seeking God humbly. You've got to give God credit for having an eternal perspective on things. He knows more than you do. Allow that fact to rule your life. That there is something, there is someone who knows more than you, who knows where you're going, who knows what's down the next path, what's right turn versus left turn, what's around the corner. He has more perspective than you. Second, be willing to lay everything before Him, even the skeletons in your closet. Because for a God who already knows everything, there's nothing that you're hiding in your closet that He's not already aware of. Sometimes I think when we pray, and I can only speak from personal experience, we want to tiptoe around the things that we're most sensitive about. We don't really want to admit to God. And I think it's really, really hard. You'd think it would be easy to admit to God just by yourself with nobody else around, no other human being to judge you. You'd think it would be easy to just be open and honest and just tell Him in plain terms, this is what I did today. I made this mistake. I committed this sin. I lusted, I lied, I coveted, I cheated. This is what I did. I find it surprisingly difficult, though, to just be honest with God and to just put things in real terms. God, this is what I did. No filters, no hiding it. This is what I did. Consider everything as rubbish compared to the glory of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Keep everything in its place. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. Where does everything belong? Even family, even loved ones, where does it belong? Below God. Now, it's not those things are unimportant. It's not that you can't love father or mother, or you can't love husband or wife or son or daughter. But Jesus does say, you cannot love those things more than you love me. And leave some things up to Him. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 in Bible class. That there's just some things that belong to the Lord. The secret things. The secret things belong to the Lord. Accept that. And be humble about it. Don't be angry that there are secrets that God is keeping from us. Add a dose of humility to your life and accept it. Does your boss keep secrets from you? Does your boss always tell you what the next step in the process is going to be? Did your father or your mother always tell you every little thing that was going on in life? Did your father ever tell you how much money he made? My dad never did that. He always kept that a secret from us. I, to this day, have no clue how much money my father makes. Because it's a secret thing that belongs to him and it's not my business. So isn't it interesting that your boss can keep a secret? That a politician can keep a secret? That your parents can keep a secret from you? And yet God keeps secret things from us and we start kicking the dust at Him and denying His existence. Let God be God. Many people come to the Bible with their minds already made up about something. That I want to believe something already. I want to confirm a preconception that I already have. Having an open mind about God, though, allows us to receive the Word with a mind that is always facing toward the truth. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. This is, I think, one of the greatest passages in all of Jeremiah, in all of the Bible. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And maybe one of the reasons that you're not getting into the deep end of the pool is because you're not fully committed. You can look at the deep end and go, oh boy, that's steep. Dark blue water down there. And I know, I know that there are secrets to be unlocked by jumping in. I know that I will never experience the true joys of the deep end, the meaningful, substantial life that God expects from me until I jump in head first. But this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to dip a toe in every now and then. Maybe I'll sit on the edge of the pool and kick my feet back and forth. 
Maybe I'll toss a couple toys in. Maybe I'll take a picture of the deep end of the pool. But we never want to commit to it fully. And God very clearly says through Jeremiah, you want to know how to find me? You will never find me until you're ready to do it with all your heart. Until finding God becomes an obsession to you. Until finding God becomes the overwhelming passion of your life. Until finding God becomes more than a hobby. Until finding God becomes more than just an activity that is reserved for Sundays and Wednesdays. Until finding God is something that you pour your entire heart into that says, I will not be satisfied until I am in the deep end, until I am with Him. You'll never find Him. You'll never find Him as long as it's a half-hearted effort. You will never find Him. There were others who wanted God on their own terms as well. I like in Matthew 11, beginning in verse 16, Jesus uses a parable. To, who, to what shall I compare this generation, He says in Matthew 11. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her children. What Jesus is saying is, He's saying, you want everything on your own terms, don't you? You're like little kids calling out to each other in the marketplace. You wanted John the Baptist to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to fit your mold, and he didn't. So you cast him out. You wanted the Son, the Messiah, the Christ, to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to fit a mold, and he didn't. So you cast him out too. You want God on your terms, defined on your ground, in your way. And you're like little kids in the marketplace calling out to each other. Just little kids. You ever listen to kids play with each other? I know. Ten minutes ago we just said kids were all sweet and innocent. But listen to kids play with each other sometimes. It's complete anarchy. It's ridiculous. I mean, they, you know, they, they're just like one minute they're having a tea party and the next minute it's a tea party in space. And then after that, the space aliens come in and they're invited to the tea party. And then after that, no, actually, they're an army. I mean, listen to kids play with each other. It's completely ridiculous. And they all want to play their own game while playing everybody else's game. I don't want to do a tea party. I want to be a spaceman. Well, you can just be a spaceman at my tea party then. Well, fine. They want to define it themselves. They want their own standard to be the standard for everybody else around them. We do the same thing to God, don't we? They wanted a Messiah who was going to fit their standard. The people of the first century wanted a shallow end Messiah, not a deep end Messiah. And a big part of letting God be God is allowing Him to remain somewhat mysterious. There's excitement in the mystery, after all, in letting some things go unspoken because satisfactory answers will never be found. Why does God allow evil to exist? Why did He create us in the first place? What about oddities in nature or questions about our biological origins? And even though I believe that there are reasonable, logical answers to all of these things that a Christian ought to accept, I also understand that many believers still struggle with them. And that's okay. Because you don't have to know what happened to the dinosaurs to go to heaven. You don't have to know exactly how old the earth is to go to heaven. You don't have to know where Satan came from and why in the world God lets Satan do what he does. You don't have to know to go to heaven. So it's okay to have questions. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you make a decision and act. Because eventually you can ask all the questions in the world, you can have all the skepticism and do all the investigating and all the reading of every book you can get your hand on, but eventually you've got to make a decision. No more riding the fence. One writer said that a decision is necessary in order to become a Christian is an idea quite foreign to many people. 
Some imagine that they are already Christians because they were born in a Christian country. We cannot remain neutral. Nor can we drift into Christianity, nor can anybody else settle the matter for us. We must decide for ourselves. We may concede that the evidence for the deity of Jesus is compelling, even conclusive, and that He was in fact the Son of God. We may believe that He came and died to be the Savior of the world. We may also admit that we are sinners and need such a Savior. But none of these things makes us Christians. God needs more than simple intellectual agreement or a belief in facts to count you among His people. We'll close with John chapter 12 and verse 42. In John chapter 12, notice what Jesus says here. And I think this leads right back into our main point about deep end versus shallow end. In John chapter 12, beginning in verse 42, it says here, Nevertheless, Many even of the rulers believed in Him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing Him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They believed. Let's not argue at that point. Let's not quibble. The text says they believed. And there's not degrees of belief that we can insert into the text that says they believed. But they were not willing to act on it. They believed a fact about Jesus, but they did not have faith enough to jump into the deep end of the pool with Him and really embrace who He was. Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary to look out at the deep blue water. It's scary when you reach that point in a pool when you're young and you're on your tiptoes and you take that last step off the slope and you realize you don't touch anymore. But don't you want to grow up beyond that? Don't you want to move past the kiddie end of the pool and see that there's more to God than just meets the eye? Maybe it's time for you to do that. But the first step really should be to become a Christian. If you're not, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as the Son of God, if you have not been baptized into His body through water baptism, if you have not made your life right with Him by changing the things in your life that don't match His will, repenting of your sins and moving forward, if you've not done those things, you're not a Christian. And friends, you're still stuck with those waiters and you're still stuck in the shallow end. It's time for you to become a Christian. So whatever needs you might have, I encourage you to please come forward as we stand and sing.